inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all, back to the innerverse. I'm your host, Chance, back at it again on a beautiful day here in the Earth Realm, recording from the 6th of September 2019, and feeling amazed that we can connect across time and space in this magnificent omniverse, because no matter what plane of reality you're inhabiting in the cosmos, we're all dwelling in the same womb of matter. And the unified source field of infinite fractal energy is just waiting for us to tune in and enter the flow, to grow into our souls as the artists that co-create the universe. What humans have mythologized as the god and goddess are not just abstract and unknowable concepts. They represent the full spectrum of physical energies and forces in the material creation. From every plant and planet to every species and speck of dust, each particle is united in the etheric crystalline womb of the Earth Mother, and the electro-spiritual spark of the masculine yang force animates all. Through this template of universal dancing polarities, we learn that by tuning in to nature's example, we can solve any problem imaginable, live any dream that we can think up, and pass through all changes with grace. Because nature's done it all before. And when we learn to look and listen for the more subtle expressions of our innermost being, we draw on the wisdom of all creation in our every breath. As artists, we can reshape the ugly into the beautiful and balance the opposites in ourselves to bring change to the entire life fractal. The wisdom of our highest forms of self speak to us most clearly through our imaginations. And that's why I'm happy to say that on this episode, we're returning to our creative roots and connecting with the Mother Goddess herself by having a conversation with one of her great avatars of this age, a passionate psychedelic paint slinger and awesome ambassador of the New Earth named Izzy Ivy. This empowered artist is a world traveler, teacher, Reiki healer, and clothing designer. But what's even more exciting than her music festival adventures is her stunning selection of oil paintings that depict fantastic, fairy-like beings and mysterious magical creatures, and the way that Izzy weaves sacred geometry and downloaded light codes into universal symbols will transport the viewer into an entirely mystical mindset. As with any time we feature a visual artist, I recommend highly that you check out the goods on Izzy's website while we get started on the chat so you can enjoy the colorful eye candy and get a feel for the whimsical dimensions that Izzy plays in. Check the show notes for links to her site, and you can find her on Instagram at Izzy underscore Ivy underscore art, where I hope you'll show her some love and thank her for talking with us today. So charge your crystals and burn your sage because it's time to explore the unknown and sing a glorious welcome throughout the land to the spokes painter for sprites and pixies and friend to the fairy folks everywhere, the literally illustrious and vivaciously vibrant Izzy Ivy for her first visit to the show. Thanks for giving us some time today, Izzy, and welcome to the Interverse. Thank you so much. What a beautiful introduction. Great to be speaking with you today. Yeah, absolutely. We've been lining this one up for a while, and I'm pretty excited. But besides my flowery language, <laughs> tell mm-hmm. us how you'd like to introduce yourself to everybody. So hi, yeah, I'm Izzy Ivy. I am a very passionate painter. I like to depict magic and share beyond the scene, like peel back the layer of the veil and just express the beauty of spirit as it dances through me, I guess. Yeah. I started painting actually only six years ago. And since that time, it's literally taken my life by force. And yeah, when you discover what your life purpose is, it's amazing what can happen in that time. Yeah. Wow. Six years isn't that long of a time span. I haven't even been doing this show for more than half of that. So it's amazing the cool style that you've developed. I think it's encouraging for someone who's like, man, I could never get to that level. And, you know, having the problem of comparing themselves to others a little too much to realize that like, you could actually spend all your time doing something, all your free time doing something and get really far if you actually were dedicated to it and not, 
you know, like me and wanting to distract yourself with a little bit of TV and video games, maybe too much. <laughs> <laughs> but I saw in your bio that your mom and dad are creator type people as well. Growing up with artists for parents, did it make it feel kind of inevitable that you'd be one as well? Or did you resist that for a while? Or did you explore a lot? How, how did that turn out for you? That's a very good question. Yeah. I mean, I've always had art in my blood. My, both my parents are visual artists. And I have, it's true, I've been creative all my life. But you know how it is. You can't do what your parents do. You have to rebel somewhere along the line. So yeah, I resisted it for a while. Actually, growing up in England, I did go to quite a lot of art galleries. But the type of art that I was experiencing was was actually making me feel like yeah, it was confirming even more that I didn't want to be an artist because it seemed quite, it was very conceptual, which is fine, but um, there seemed like a lot of negative energy around it. And anyway, it was really when I decided that maybe you could create something positive, you know, create a piece of art that has high vibes in it. Then I suddenly shifted my thoughts around what art had become to me. But yeah, my my mom's been pretty supportive with with the art that I'm doing, but my dad still doesn't understand it at all. <laughs> yeah. That's probably pretty common for a lot of us. <laughs> it's amazing how far we can progress in our perspective on things in just one generation. And I kind of agree with you that the whole modern art or maybe even like what you call institutionalized art is mm. I, I don't know if it always has got dark energy, but sometimes it just seems like it lacks a certain amount of imagination to it. I I don't want to hate on anybody that has a style that's simplistic because I definitely don't. But when you go into a gallery and it's just everything is maybe like some squares or some splashes of paint on a canvas, you know, that doesn't tell a vision so much. I like that you can interpret things as however you want, especially the simpler they are. And, you know, there's... A, there's a cool aesthetic there, I'm sure, to some people, they might really love that. But for me, I mean, you're looking at my shirt right now. I'm wearing a Chris Dyer Positive Creations t-shirt. I like colorful, crazy, vibrant. <laughs> That's kind of how I like to create art, too. So I definitely feel you there. So you started out in England. What ended up making you move to Australia? Well, it really was just this very strong feeling in my soul. I can't really explain it. I I finished uni and I just told everyone I'm moving to Australia and they didn't really believe me. But yeah, I made it happen. I was there for 10 years. And yeah, I guess that's where I discovered my passion for painting. But I sort of went on a journey of clothing design before that. I was designing fairy goddess, priestess kind of wear with crystals and natural fibers and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, somebody introduced me to oil paints and my life was never the same again. <laughs> That's awesome. And could you tell us about the modern incarnation of your clothing design? Because I didn't even mention that in the introduction, really. But that's something that people could check out if they're interested too, right? Where can they find it? Yeah. yeah. Well, I still got two lines going. One of them is Amulet Bikinis, which is yeah, amuletbikinis.com. And I basically turn my artwork into goddess like bikinis with chains and crystals and geometries and so they're you know the idea is that you can adorn your temple um, so that's those and I do actually also create wedding dresses which are kind of alternative wedding dresses elven style but with a bit of steampunk twist yeah and that's unfeldbridal.com but I've definitely been focusing a lot more with the art I'd like to give those projects a bit more love soon but they're all, they all feed into each other and yeah, the inspiration is there for the interweaving. <laughs> it's cool that you're at a phase where you're able to do that and play with multiple mediums and still express like sort of a unified vision. Was there any specific part of your journey you could share that you feel had a hand in shaping the vision that you're now expressing today? Hmm. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing that I learned, which relates to my ability to paint the way that I do, but is also related to and parallels my lifestyle is getting out of your own way. <laughs> so getting your mind out of the way. You know, when I was younger, I, you know, I did try drawing here and there, but I never really felt like I got what I was trying to express. 
But as soon as I allowed myself to flow more with the feeling of what I wanted to express, usually what would happen is I would totally be able to embody the essence of what I was bringing through, but in a totally different, the journey was very different. It's what I teach in my workshops now too. So we, it's just this process of um, going into more of like a meditative space and yeah, just allowing that flow state to just dance through you. And then it's the same with my lifestyle now. It's, it's this feeling of trust. I mean, obviously I'm human and I'm, I'm still working at it as well, but you know, it's having the vision of what you, where you want to be going, what, what projects you want to be taking on board and what countries you want to visit and all of that and just start acting like it's already happening but not micromanaging it so much that you don't have the spaciousness for spirit to drop in and, you know, allow that uh, serendipity to unveil itself. That's cool. I'm curious if you have any advice on the artistic side of that flow state. I mean, the, the life side of it, that's definitely something we're all learning constantly how to not overly manage ourselves. But is there anything more you could say about the, the trance of generating your ideas or getting into the zone? Absolutely. Something that I absolutely love to do as well as pain is to dance. So I love ecstatic dance where I just allow myself to fall into a natural light trance state, I guess. And that's where I receive a lot of the ideas, you know, or, you know, spending time in nature, meditation, all of those places where you just feel that sense of peace within yourself. And um, it's more like a receptive place. But people often ask me, like, do you have a really strong idea about what you're going to paint when you're about to start a piece? And I, and I say, well, it's, it's sort of 50-50. So I have, I have the, the outline of the idea in the back of my mind. But actually, the, the very, the, just being in that painting space, you know, you naturally find yourself in dropping into a, like a theater or a more relaxed brainwave where you're more receptive. So just the act of painting itself gets you into that state. So I don't like to have too much of a direct idea because I feel like there's a lot more information that starts to channel through when I'm literally in front of the canvas. But I think the main thing is to just start it, just start the painting. Like you probably, we might not be immediately in that trance state, but you know, even if you just, just start with the background, I mean, that would be a great thing. A bit of advice is to just get some color down on the canvas, get rid of that blank canvas notion. And then even the act of doing that will start preparing you for what's going to actually come through. Yeah. In your, in your painting. That makes total sense, actually. To me, it's like your brain is some sort of computer in this metaphor, and it's only got so much memory available. And you have, if you're trying to, you know, bring through a big vision that's got a lot of detail and a lot of parts and pieces and symbols, it makes more sense to just let your intuitive side or your right brain hand that out to your conscious side, your left brain one packet at a time, you know, okay, this is what you need to know now. And then you'll sort of, it's like a chain of ideas instead of one big idea that you have to hold all in there at once. I know, I know how, how you feel or how you're describing that. That makes a lot of sense. It's great advice, actually. Mm, yeah, actually, on that same subject, I feel like that's how this whole journey has unfolded. It's, uh, I, I'll say I recently just finished my second Oracle deck and wrote that one as well, Beyond the Myria will be out soon. But actually, if I'd known that I was going to both write and illustrate an Oracle deck, I would be like, no way. <laughs> but it was like the universe just little gave me little like seg segments at a time. And the full thing just unveiled. <laughs> well, tell me more about the Oracle deck because I'm a fan of those. I have a nice little variety of different ones myself. My favorite being the I Ching Oracle. But could you tell us more about the Lemuria deck and what inspires it? What kind of symbols do you use in the art and in the meanings of the cards that make it stand out? I'd love to hear it about it at length. This is really cool. I didn't even know that you had this Oracle deck, so excited to check it out myself. Mm, yeah, well, for quite a long, quite a few years now, maybe like seven or eight years ago, I've been getting visions about 
Lemuria. If you want to know more, check it out online. But it feels like it's like the remembering. So right now we're coming to a stage on Earth where, you know, things are getting pretty real. And, and there's this, this idea that there was an epoch before this one, also around the time of Atlantis. And since probably about seven or eight years ago, I've been having visions about this place these light beings which are partly incarnated they're connected very much with nature and they have like healing abilities they work telepathically and i would recommend re researching them a little bit more because there is quite a lot of information on it for anyone that's interested but yeah i mean it's said that they're they were the ancestors of our ancestors so it's really going back to the indigenous like the core uh, information that is in the earth and that is in nature and that right now on earth we need to be re returning to to those those messages and yeah since I stepped up into deciding to create this oracle deck I've been showing you the more visions and as I say I'm not usually a writer but I was given yeah, I, I mean, all I can say is it felt like a channeling experience. I sort of had to get myself into quite a high vibration. And then actually with pencil and paper, I um, just downloaded all the meanings. But I started with all the paintings. So there was 56 paintings in total. And each one, it looks like a, you know, a pretty picture, but there's like a lot of symbolism inside each. It's almost like codes. I really like the idea that my art can be colourful and fun and accessible to anyone, but that there's this deeper meaning of information. So yeah, it was a really amazing journey unravelling the information and the codes in written form. I generally prefer to let people, you know, get their own understanding from the image, but it did give me a whole other level of uh, insight. Uh, but what was really interesting about that whole process was for every theme that I was working with, I had to experience it in my own life. <laughs> so that was a big journey and, you know, call it universe university, you know, where you, you get the, the lessons and the teachings and the upgrades through just life. But it was just incredible, the uh, parallel with themes that I'll be, I was working with. and. Yeah, amazing journey, but I was also quite pleased to complete it. <laughs> really cool. I'm pretty excited to check it out. And that's basically the reason why I wanted to talk to you was because of the way that your art hit me whenever I would check it out. I'd be like, there's a lot going on in here as far as meaning that you could find and unpack from source, really. It felt like source messages channeled through the paint. And also that you're depicting fairy folk and that type of, you know, mystical or fantastical creature, they have some potential existence on another plane of existence or possibly in our ancestors' time. If a species was entirely wiped out, does their spirit leave the earth, for example? It could still be hanging around in some form or with us in some way. And there's a lot of cool stuff <laughs> in your art that it makes me think of wild possibilities, man. But what I wanted to say was that just like the art itself requires this type of flow state where you have to not fully know the vision, you just take the steps and they create the vision, our chain of descendancy or ascendancy from our ancestors, depending on the direction that we're going, is very much like that type of art project for the overall collective human spirit. And unfortunately, for a bunch of generations in a row, there's been people who kind of not through their own intention typically, but have broken the chain of communication and got stuck on the same step because they weren't taking the authentic self-expression step, whether it's because they were in a, a feudal situation in the Middle Ages or they're a modern person who is more interested in sacrificing their health for money than expressing their reason for being on the planet. No, not that we shouldn't love those people, but it, I think it's our responsibility to actually honor the ancestors by honoring the art project that is planet Earth, right? Instead of uh, just <laughs> scribbling all over it and saying, 
I don't care who comes after me. I don't care who came before me. I'm just going to do whatever I want, no matter the consequences. That's what it all made me think of. You're, you're, I was getting a little bit of a down though myself through that because I've never had that type of realization about the DNA being the way we pass on DNA being like similar to the flow state of a piece of artwork as it's being created. Mm, wow. I really loved your depiction there. I mean, one of the things I love about doing this kind of art is that there is something, there's definitely a bigger picture perspective of the meaning of each creation. And it's emphasized that anybody that looks at it gleans their own, their own message. So, you know, what it might mean for you is different for somebody else, but it speaks to a different part of us. I think that's the thing that has been a, a big lesson for me is to, yeah, communicate from another part of us. So it doesn't matter what language we speak or what our upbringing is or whatever, but there's this familiarity and I feel like there's, there's a connectivity when people see it or, yeah, I mean, for me, even just doing this kind of work, it feels like being a little bit of a beacon for the kind of kin that I'm so excited to meet that, you know, we feel like family because <laughs> we're like, oh, I recognize that, you know, it's, it's really curious. So following your passions, I mean, that's the best way to meet people that you really vibe with. I feel like that's a core piece of advice we should all keep in mind that you're more likely to meet your new best friend if you go out to do something that you really love doing rather than going out with the intention just of killing time or meeting someone or, you know, getting wasted or, or whatever the case may be. It's uh, your vibe attracts your tribe. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I love that notion. Yeah. I, I got a little message the other day and it was just that like keep doing what you love and then you'll be able to keep doing what you love, you know? So it's following, for me, it's like following the whispers. What is it that fills me up so much that I want to keep doing it? In fact, actually I didn't paint for many years because crazily enough, I just felt like it was too indulgent, which I am aware that maybe some people also share that feeling. You know, there's always something more important that should be done. But what is, when I unpacked that, it was, well, that was the thing that just made me the, the happiest I could be. And, you know, people are often like, well, what is my life purpose? And it's like, well, what makes you feel that like you have this overflow? You could just keep giving and it would never really run out. And you just love whatever it is so much that I feel like that's, that's the, that's the jigsaw puzzle piece that we're all here to, you know, coalesce. What it made me think of is that the reason why someone doesn't do what they love to do isn't because of whatever reason they give it. Mm. It's because they are not doing it. <laughs> as soon as you make the decision to just do what it is you love, then the reasons for not doing it will find their way out of the picture. Exactly. Exactly. But, you know, unfortunately the way the society, I guess that we're in, there's this pressure to, to sort of step out of that. And, you know, there's obviously the logistical element of, Oh gosh, well, what if, if I do that, then what about this? Or what about that? And I need to do this job to make this money. And honestly, like it's scary sometimes. And some, I definitely question like, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, sometimes I get led down these garden paths by my spirit and I'm like, are you sure? And you know, it's just when you step and you take that leap off the cliff with your big open wide wings of trust. And you know, there's definitely a fair bit of devotion, dedication and an organization but you know if you can just truly decide that that's what you really want to do the universe supports you and it is unreal sometimes it absolutely is blowing me away sometimes with the way i'm feeling support from my surroundings to just continue to do to walk this journey yeah it's one of my favorite words pronoia which is the opposite of paranoia it's the sneaking suspicion that things in the background are conspiring in your favor <laughs> instead of conspiring yeah. against you. So I want to talk a little bit more about fairies because I'm really curious what drew you to start depicting those type of mythical creatures in your artwork and maybe what you know about the folklore that you find interesting. Mm. Well, I guess as a magical being, uh, my first understanding of these realms were through fairies growing up in in England 
always enjoying the sacred sites there and the undoubtable feeling that there was these little magical beings around. Yeah, but actually it's interesting because although it might seem that I'm painting fairies, really I feel like they're multidimensional beings, but they're often they have wings. So, and I feel like wings for me, I'm pretty, pretty into wings. Uh, I have a lot of tattoos of wings on my body, but um, it's really the symbolism of what that means. And it's quite simple, really. It's, you know, the, the idea of freedom and um, it's, uh, so it's, so, you know, it could even be like an angelic um, or angelic wings or, you know, yeah, obviously insect wings or fairy wings. I guess for me, I'm working with symbolism in all of my pieces and it's what the different appendages and attire that the, the beings that I create have explain their story. So each painting, there's like almost like a whole story going on there, even if I don't even know what it is until I finish the painting. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, a lot of people just assume that you know, they're just like, oh, you're a fairy. <laughs> you just look like a fairy. So uh, I'll go with that. But I mean, for me, I, I definitely have delved down that road a fair bit. And it's, it's beings that are in the betwixt in between, you know, they have one foot or they're partly, partly incarnated, partly in the physical and partly in the etheric. And I definitely have an affinity with the idea of being a bridger in terms of having an awareness of the multi multi-dimensional realms but also being able to ground it in this physical realm because you know that's how we're gonna wake people up and remind them that there is this whole like what we're experiencing is just the you know this physical reality is just a teeny tiny tip of the, the iceberg so yeah and plus there's that energy of like light-heartedness and fun you know with with that sort of fairy elemental energy and of course the connection with mother earth and nature and the beauty that goes with that yeah super cool (laughs) i love all of that stuff too for the same reasons and i find it fascinating to think about the even physical reality of such beings i mean multi-dimensional they may be or hyper-dimensional i guess the uh, there are occultists that i'm familiar with and some i know personally that actually will make the claim and i guess maybe they've read books i haven't that they're is actually a bloodline or multiple bloodlines in humanity that are carried by some people in their genetics that connect us back to little people and magical folk. So I think that's kind of cool. It could be almost like a revival of our ancestral birthright to begin opening up our perspective about life, the universe and everything to include you know, more magic and and more manifestation power and a more constant perpetual flow of synchronicity through life, which I think is what artists like yourself show us is possible. And it's brave because when you have 99% of the world telling you, you need to stay put and get a job or make sure you save up money and have insurance and blah, 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 and all this stuff. So you need to be afraid of the war and shouldn't go there because there's crime. And, you know, like you have every reason not to go boldly into the unknown (laughs) but bravo to you for doing it and keep keep at it i say because i think it's really cool and then the other thing i'd say about the the fairy stuff is that there could be a connection to all kinds of mythologies i mean you said they seem angelic there could be you know beings of that nature that people mistake for aliens in the modern day i think there's a likelihood that all that stuff is connected but what do you think Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I think as you traverse the realms of dimensions beyond the one that we're familiar with, you meet all kinds of different beings. You know, they're not something we can normally see with our physical eyes, but when we raise our vibration, because they're of a higher vibration, then that's when we start having contact with them. So, you know, it's an interesting one. A lot of people often ask me, oh, were you you tripping when you painted that? Or like, have you had alter mind altering experiences to create this this work but i'm like no this is actually when you when you can just peel back the veil this is all here like in its multi and you know in colors that we've never even you know we're not used to even seeing so i feel like it's yeah it's all it's all around us it's just whether we are able to have that perception so i mean that's another reason why i do the art that i do and also why i'm so interested in 
different healing modalities. That's what it's known as, but working with life force energy in a way that is centered around raising one's vibration because, I mean, there's so many benefits that come as a result of, of doing that, especially, you know, as we grow and expand and, you know, ascend even, we have the opportunity to move through the things that are out of that vibration and, you know, triggers and shadows can come up. But when we maintain that raised vibration, then we can see the bigger picture perspective and actually transmute it. When we can raise our vibration, then we also, we, we access so much more of the world around us. But yeah, going back to your original question about the fairies and aliens and all of that, people often say that, you know, they can't, they can't imagine seeing an alien or any of these different beings, but why wouldn't they be of a higher vibration? There's, I feel like there's a lot of different beings that are also inhabiting other planets as well as this planet, but why would they roll with the same laws as we do on our, you know, 3D realm? So it's just, it's just something that we can't really quite fathom. And the uh, psychedelics, I guess, can be the training wheels to remove the, you know, to show us what's possible, what we couldn't originally fathom. But yeah, when we start traversing these dimensions, anything's possible, really. I tend to agree. And when you look at just the spectrum of light that's visible, we know of a huge up and down expanding of that light spectrum that's outside of our ability to perceive it. And for all we know, raising our vibration or using psychedelics is just giving you access to seeing more of it. I think evidence of that is the fact that people on plant medicines have dilated pupils, like sometimes really huge. So more light is coming into their, you know, their mind, so to speak, through the portal of the eyes. And I think that to me, that, sh- that demonstrates that you're seeing more of the light spectrum anyway. I, I definitely <laughs> like this line of questioning, but uh, now I want to maybe switch gears and talk about some of your adventures recently, if you have any stories you can share with us. I know that you were just in Bali. Do you have anything to d- talk about from that trip? What were you doing there? Well, I have recently just come to the acceptance that I think I feel at home in quite a few countries now. I've never felt entirely at home on earth, I guess. And my time in Australia that I I was there for 10 years completed last year. It just felt like it was time to go somewhere else. So yeah, with everything that I, or the money that I had in that moment, I booked a flight to Bali. And the very next day I sold some paintings for more than I think I ever have. It's a confirmation that it was time to really take the step. So yeah, I, I spent some time there. It was, it was actually because I was about to write the Oracle deck and I wanted to be in a particular vibration. And I had a very strong vision about this beautiful desk overlooking, you know, rice fields with lots of sunlight. And sure enough, I found that place when I was in Bali and planned to be there for a month. But I decided I've, that is, has essentially been my home for the last year. But I say it's been home. And actually, during that time, I, I have traveled a lot. I was, I've honestly just been following the whispers, which took me to many different parts of the States last year, to Peru, back to England to connect with my ancestry there and my Peru roots. And yeah, back to Australia. I'm now teaching workshops regularly as I travel, something called Anchoring Light, which is just a weekend workshop, but it's a full immersive journey to accessing your light codes and letting spirit dance you and anchoring them onto your canvas where you learn about how to paint magic and make things look glowing and iridescent and holographic. So that's that's something that I'm sharing. I'm actually about to teach one tomorrow and I love it. I didn't realize how much I love to teach. Um, actually, my mom's an art teacher and so therefore I never thought I would ever go down that road, but actually I, I guess it probably is in my blood. But yeah, right now I'm in the States. I'm quite in love with the West Coast and looking forward to doing a trip to Sedona next week for a few weeks. Uh, Also feeling spirit calling me to paint in some sacred places. Yeah, there's something that I love to do and that is to go to different sacred sites and and channel a painting. When I was first shown that I was going to write this oracle deck uh, beyond Lemuria, Lemurians, they have a very strong connection with Mount Shasta. 
Uh, I'd never been to America before, but they were like, it's all right, we'll, we'll help you figure it out. And sure enough, uh, well, two years ago now, I uh, was on the top of Mount Shasta and I channeled the piece that ended up holding all the codes for the whole deck, which I didn't actually realize. I didn't really even understand what I painted until I started unpacking it. And I was absolutely blown away when I realized the synchronicity of all the elements that I'd already created the container for within that, within that deck. Yeah, and then being called to go to Kauai at the beginning of October. So, yeah, it's exciting. And I'm also very ready to do an exhibition which is in process. I've got about 20 originals and it's going to be called Galactic Prayers. I know that much. Um, and they're all, yeah, they're all, the paintings are all prayers of some form. Feeling meaningful right now, the codes that they're holding. They just want to be shared with the world. So. Yeah. <laughs> I did see a painting that you shared recently on Instagram with a story about not making it out to Burning Man and then going to Mount Shasta and kind of a recalibration process you took in the downtime. And you also talked about the great central sun that coexists at the core of our reality and within all of ourselves. So I was wondering what you could say about our micro, macro, cosmic connection to all, all the things. <laughs> And mm -hmm. how do we draw on that for strength? Mm. The inspiration for that painting came a few months ago, actually in a place called the Sunshine Coast. I was introduced to a sacred site that I was inspired to just sit down and meditate. And he was like, okay, what do you see? You know, and sometimes when there's, when there's a lot of energy around something, or there's some expectation, you know, it doesn't usually end up happening. But sure enough, it was like the portal opened and uh, I had this experience with these golden beings that came out of the earth and talked to me and showed me some codes that I'd never seen before and the light that they were, it was just this beautiful, warm, all-encompassing, energizing light. It's funny because I've never really been into the golden rays or the, the, the oranges or the yellows, but yeah, they, would, they, they basically sort of expressed that. So I've, I've been doing a lot. And I was a little, you know, a little tired. And they said, you know, like you can you can tune into sun energy, which is incredibly powerful, and the, the central, the great central sun. And actually, there's a sun in the center of the Earth, <laughs> which took me a bit to kind of wrap my head around, but understanding that it's like a multi-dimensional sun or environment that made more sense to me, especially as I've been exploring Shasta and the idea that there are, you know multidimensional beings that are under the mountain. Yeah, anyway, and I was just shown that I could connect to all of those energy centers through this, this almost the sun within myself, which is my solar plexus. But it was, it was almost like somewhere between my heart and my solar plexus. Yeah, I mean, it was an interesting journey and it's hard to really put it into words, you know, how it is when you try and explain something like this. It just sounds like 1% of what, what you experience, but, you know, that's really why I paint. I don't really like to add too many words to what's going on in the paintings because it, it, I feel like I can describe it in a more multidimensional way rather than in a linear way when I'm painting. But, yeah, since that experience, I had this... I think I saw the most incredible sky, uh, starlit sky that I've ever seen uh, a couple of days later and then just ridiculous sunsets. And, and then at Mount Shasta, I met some kin, well, a, a friend that has also got a, a strong solar energy. And yeah, there was just a lot of confirmation with this information that I've been experiencing, you know, these downloads that I've been having for the last sort of eight years. Sometimes, you know, you can just, you kind of forget them. I forget them when I go back into my human, if that makes sense. Um, you know, it's just like a dream and you, you, you just kind of get on with your life. But, but I feel it's in my field. And that's, you know, when I go to paint, that's when these codes come through. And they might, you know, you probably notice that there's, sometimes there are like actual geometric light codes in my paintings. But sometimes the codes actually do come through personified with, you know, characters that are attached to them, not because they are actually beings, but because they're a way that, you know, humans naturally feel more of an affinity with something with a face and eyes and something that they could, you know, feel like they can have a connection with. So, yeah, I like to personify these, this information. 
Super cool. I love hearing stories about meeting light beings. And it's not every day that we get something like that told to us on the show. Although you aren't the first person who's had experiences like that, that seem Mm -hmm. to really draw wisdom out of their connection to, you know, the beyond human side (laughs) of yourself. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I get what you mean too about coming back with maybe just 1% of conscious knowledge of whatever it was and having to find some other outlet to get it out piece by piece. That's kind of what it means to have a download, you know, like on a computer, it's only, it can only come through so fast. It doesn't just all appear at once. And I think for me, the type of experiences you're talking about are more commonly uh, happening to me whenever I'm in a meditative state looking within. And then, you know, I might have this whole conversation with, another part of myself that seems like a external character kind of in in the moment. And then when I come back, it's just like, it feels like I just totally forgot all of it instantly, (laughs) but it's definitely still in there. You know, sometimes the most amazing secrets get to reveal to you there. And maybe it's just not time for that to be blurted out in our vulgar English language speech, (laughs) or maybe there's not a way to do it in the English language oftentimes. Absolutely. Well, I think it's actually, I, li- I like the fact that we can be poetic about sharing this information and metaphorical. I mean, for me, painting it feels like a good medium because, you know, the information's in there. But if you just tell someone, oh, well, you know, it was this otherworldly being that shared this information with me, or, or, you know, if you're really cut and dry about the fact that you've had these experiences for some people that's really quite hard for them to take on board or you know I think it's really good to have it as accessible information and I don't know even to keep it a little stealth even I feel like people are often drawn to you know whether it is music or art or whatever it is with this visionary with this with these un- layers of underlying information but again it's you know if they were to intellectualize it they might have they might come up to there might be a bit of a boundary around it but i feel like it's a a gentle way of just just allowing them to come to that conclusion themselves or even they may have had experiences or dreams or whatever where they've also experienced something like that uh, in fact i have a lot of people come to me just saying, oh, you, you painted my vision. I can't believe it. Like I've never been able to share this with anyone or whatever. And it's nice confirmation when people suddenly see that and they realize that, I don't know, they're not crazy. <laughs> we're all, we're all crazy together, but you know. I, I think I totally agree with you because whenever you explain something to somebody through imagery and through art, it has a lot higher probable chance of bypassing the left brain filter. And then the right brain takes it in all the meaning and symbolism to the unconscious, whether or not the person unpacks it consciously. It's like you've planted some seeds for them to either remember their own metaphysical or transcendental experiences or at least recognize them when they do inevitably occur. Because I think we, for the most part, all have them, whether it's through dreams or visions or straight up seeing uh, light beings come and hang out with you. But the other thing that I was thinking about was when you over depend with the cities or spiritual superpowers that is possible to develop to the point that you begin to identify with them. You tend to lose them. The example would be people who, no offense to those who, you know, are psychics and provide that type of service to others because this doesn't apply to everyone. Some people use these abilities in a balanced way. But when you become so f- sure or full of yourself or your abilities that you think, Every little premonition or intuition is absolutely right. And everyone needs to like do what you say or you're the special one or whatever. That is definitely the point where you start actually blocking yourself from being able to access that. So using art to get your message through, you're bringing beauty into the world as opposed to sort of propping yourself up as a a super person that's beyond everyone else. Not that, you know, as an artist, we all are unique and that's a better way to be special than to try to have like magical powers that others need to depend on you for. Mm, Yeah. Wow. There's so many directions I could take that. 
what you just shared, I, th- I think that's a really, really valid point. And it's a really interesting thing to consider because actually um, it's something that I've been also aware of. Even in that last painting that you mentioned, you know, I shared a bit about it and the fact that, you know, I wasn't, everything just did not align for me going to Burning Man. And I had to, I had to kind of look at the reasons for why I wanted to go. And I realized that, you know, well, put it this way, about two years ago, I made a pact with myself that I would, no matter what, be in my integrity, like peel back the layers about why I wanted to do what, what my underlying motives for mainly, you know, creating art in the world. And, you know, it was generally always coming from a pure place, but it's very easy, I suppose, when you start getting more successful or whatever to start to fall back into the matrix and this idea of success and the things that you should be doing in order to continue the the identity that you have, I suppose. But, you know, I feel that the universe often just gives me a big slap when I, <laughs> when I start to wander off that path even slightly. And I feel like that's what recently happened and it was a, a good wake-up call. Just, it's just, you know, I think as long as we're, yeah, we're just following that, that devotional heart-centered place, we can't go wrong. But, you know, we still do live in the matrix and we do need to survive. And, you know, it's good to get known as an artist and be here, there and everywhere so that you can continue doing art. But it's also being real about, you know, even the idea of burning out or, you know, I think it just goes back to what I was saying before about if you're doing it from a place of overflow rather than obligation, you know, that thing about what it feels to have your purpose when you you just have this emanation of continuous ability to keep doing what you're doing or a lot more energy. I I mean, for me personally, I, I feel like I have a lot more energy doing this and maybe a more unusual lifestyle of being an artist and things that are connected to that than I would if I was working a regular job. Yeah. I think it's really interesting as well. I have, I've been doing energy, energy work for about 13 years now. I uh, started learning Reiki back then. Um, I'm teaching it now these days too. I tried other modalities and yeah, I've always loved that, uh, the fact that you can literally put your hands on yourself or on someone else to raise their vibration. But there's definitely, you know, you, hmm, okay, just like aligning to the original question that you asked. <laughs> but I feel like doing it, sharing that, the, the medicine that I f- feel so inspired with, with the energy work through the paintings instead. I mean, for one, it does reach more people simultaneously and it's great to be sprinkling this information through stuff like Facebook and Instagram where they are the platforms where I feel like we need to have a little bit of this extra wake up magic in in the mix. But yeah, I do think what you said about having it as a a visual element just means that people can take what they what they need from it. It's not pushing any dogmatic belief system on anyone it's like here's a bunch of symbols and feel ways you can feel and you you take that as an oracle for whatever you need whereas yeah so i feel like that's become a better container than just the direct hands-on healing for me personally just for me personally i mean i think the two go hand in hand but yeah (laughs) this is great i wanted to ask you about reiki actually because it's a great topic and really interesting. I think the more people we can just expose to the idea of what it is, the more we'll be likely to just self-activate with that skill. And even if it doesn't become something that you're offering up to others, just knowing that it's possible to channel universal energy towards healing and repair and wholeness means that you can start doing it for yourself anytime that you feel low on energy. Because at the end of the day, how you feel is just an idea, just like everything else. It's all mental. So I was wondering if you could talk more about what Reiki is to you and has been to you and how, you know, how it feels to do it or how you do it, if you can put that into words in any way, because it might really leave 
some clues for people out there for what they might be able to achieve with their own energy. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's actually something I'm really passionate about uh, talking about. I mean, I use the term Reiki, but that's really just because that's a, that's a word that people are more familiar with in this day and age. But, you know, it's, it's essentially, yeah, just focused life force energy. And there are many, many different modalities. As I say, I've, I've explored quite a few of them, but I, I've always actually returned to Reiki because it's, it's so simple and you can combine it with other things. You can be really creative with how you combine it too. And it's definitely one of the key elements that's in my paintings. I think it's just a really, I think one thing about walking our spiritual path is that it's great to have a toolkit, you know, because as we do, you know, raise our vibrations or whatever, we often become more sensitive as well. And to have a toolkit that allows us to more gracefully navigate that journey is kind of a paramount, I would say. The ability to give yourself a healing or a clearing is one of the base, the best tools you can use. You know, it's like sometimes we go into environments and we, you know, we can come out and feel drained or, you know, if we've been pushing ourselves too hard or whatever, you know, I mean, it's great to have a session from someone else, but if you, if you're like, if it's you that's giving it to yourself, then obviously you can do it wherever you are, whenever you want to do it, you know, on the train, like before bed, you know, and it's, it's, it's also about intention as well, which you can bring into absolutely everything, you know, even your eating, your, yeah, ev- everything. Yeah, I just think that ability to essentially raise your vibration at will on demand is really uh, a really beautiful thing. But it also, yeah, well, who doesn't want to, well, put it this way, for me, the, the feeling of experiencing Reiki or, you know, life force energy moving through my body is like one of the most blissful experiences. There is nothing quite so, yeah, wonderful as, as having that, that energy moving through me. And, you know, we're, we're accustomed to searching outside of ourselves for things that make us feel better. And if we can literally just be with what is our essentially divine birthright in terms of this energy that's just all around us. Why, you know, why not? Yeah. And I mean, there's just one other thing and that is just being energy aware beings, you know, it's not, we are not taught about energy when we are kids and ironically it is the root of, of everything that we do. So just having the awareness of energy, it's like it opens up a whole other way of perceiving Life, yes, in all of its facets. Cool. I, it's like astral or energetic hygiene. This has been a really awesome conversation. And Izzy, it's been an honor and pleasure to get your perspective and wisdom about life, the universe, and everything, and painting and festivals and all this stuff that a lot of us love so much. And I wanted to give you the opportunity to give any closing thoughts that you have any threads that you felt were unwoven uh, incomplete and then also remind everyone where they can find you online or if there's anywhere they might see you in person somewhere on the earth coming up Mm, great yeah well actually there was one final thing that i felt to to share sometimes we have these little quirks about our personalities or about who we are that don't necessarily make sense or fit into the identity that we have about ourselves, but sometimes they're actually also major parts to our purpose for being here, or they fit into something that we may not have even discovered yet. So for me, I'm synesthetic and dyslexic. So when I when I was younger, I used to be extremely bombarded by colors and shapes, especially when I started to try and articulate experiences that were beyond the mind. And it would be a process of like translating them and I found it very frustrating but then when I got into energy work I realized it was the perfect narrative for journeying with someone because there was this whole other language essentially that I was able to understand and then it was even more useful when I discovered painting because it was a way that I was able to express this information through the way a color faded into another color or the flow of 
the softness into the hardness of the shape. You know, there's, there's a whole dialogue that goes with the imagery that speaks beyond just the character or the image that's in the picture. It's like the way it's actually been rendered. So, yeah, if there's anything that you're wondering about within yourself and you're also like considering what your life purpose might be if you're not aware just yet, I think it's just a good message to, for people to look at some of those elements about themselves too. And, yeah, and then even returning to that shadow work element of some of our, our greatest the things that we struggle with are often the things that we came here to do because it gives us the opportunity to do the most homework for it. So we have great compassion when we share it with others and we know the subject well then. So I'm glad you brought that up because actually that was the one thing on my list of questions that I didn't get to was I wanted to ask you about being synesthetic, having synesthesia. Yeah. So great. You picked up on the unanswered question that I didn't ask. <laughs> cool. <laughs> really cool. There you go. Tuned in. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. That's a good synchronicity right there. Perfect. Perfect. So yeah, I feel like it's good to finish with that, that little nugget. Yeah, in terms of finding me um, around and about the place, I plan to do another workshop in San Francisco at the end of, at the beginning of October, actually, Anchoring Light. And I'm planning to do an exhibition there also at the beginning of October. You can, you can keep updated by checking out my Instagram. I think we mentioned that before. It's easy underscore IV underscore art. Uh, my website is www.izzyivart.com. And yeah, feel free to reach out if you would like to find out more when I'm sharing some of these, these weekends. And yeah, I'm pretty obsessed with painting, so I will always be posting new pieces. So just stay tuned. <laughs> Yeah, I do recommend you guys go follow on Instagram if you use that platform or at least visit the website. But it is 3.33 p.m. I think that's a great time to finish it up. So thanks so much for being with us, Izzy. Can't wait to get this episode out to the world. And best of luck on your many travels, wherever they take you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really great to uh, unpack some of this stuff (laughs) and hear your uh, perception of it too. Yeah, I like the mind meld with people like yourself. So very appreciated and much love. Well, people, if that one doesn't give you everything you're asking for in an episode of Interverse, I don't know what to tell you. We had Lemuria, trance states, flow states, Oracle decks, spirit world. (laughs) I mean, we talked about the galactic central sun, light code downloads, energy healing and Reiki, all of that and more just in the first hour. So it's definitely my kind of conversation. I'm really glad that Izzy was willing to take the chance on Interverse and give us a shot on this conversation outside of her normal medium of creation. And because she's such a free spirited traveler, it actually took us quite a while to line up an appropriate time to talk and Her patience with that is also to be commended. I think it was definitely the right time and the right place. This conversation feels exactly right where I'm at as a person right now. So I loved it. And if you thought the first hour was magical like I did, we went way more into fifth dimensional, high vibrational type of thoughts in the plus extension. And I'll remind you what plus is. If you're not a member, you can subscribe on patreon.com forward slash interverse or using the link in the show notes to Throw me a few dollars per month and get yourself double length episodes and unlock the whole archive of past plus shows, some of which are quite wild. Actually, they're all good. But in general, you're getting half of the show that you love so much if you're not subscribed to plus and you're just doing the free episodes. And I know it's a pain to paywall stuff, but really, this is the most ideal way that we can reciprocate energy to one another. Me, the energy of doing the show, you a little bit of energy in the form of supporting it. and it's good for everybody. And that's kind of like important as far as balance goes that it's not always a one sided connection where you're just taking or just giving, right? So, in plus, the things we talked about definitely, like I said, got more interesting and magical. If you ask me, we started off talking about the importance of energetic astral hygiene, especially in relation to doing energy healing like Reiki and the fusing of multiple tools to merge healing modalities and rituals to make Reiki more effective. We define the physical and spiritual aspects of shadow work and why they are totally integral to self-realization. 
We talked about mindfully taking our power back from triggers, crystal experiences, and the amazing strength of Moldavite, the feeling of festival live painting, and Izzy gave her advice for actually doing it. And she told the story about growing through a bout of dengue fever and staying in the perpetual flow of synchronicity throughout her days and her journeys and travels through and into the unknown and beyond. So she's definitely the type of artist that's living the lifestyle that many of us might aspire to. I mean, yeah, sure, some of us might want to just settle down and do our art in one place, and that's not bad. But I know many more of us probably do have like that travel fever or itch, especially in our 20s and early 30s, just want to see the world, right? Well, what was cool about this conversation is it really did emphasize the mindset required to be in like the trust relationship with yourself in the universe to get yourself to that type of sovereignty and freedom. And also we talked about cool things in the plus extension revolving energy hygiene, which I think is important too, to help you not get stuck in any one particular vibe or absorb too much of other people's vibes. And just regardless of what your practice is for energy hygiene, if it's meditation or burning sage and taking some deep breaths and just letting stuff go, there's a lot of ways to do it, but it's important physiologically to reduce our stress and activate that parasympathetic nervous system so our body can kick into gear on healing and our DNA can unpack and unfurl itself into more expansive variations of our life story. You know, we don't want to just be in one fear vibration the entire time or for too long. We want to integrate and move out of the shadow of our powers and into the actual <laughs> magnificent abilities that we have to co-create and coexist and be at home anywhere and many other powers as well. And one thing that this got me thinking about specifically was oracles. And so I pulled out my favorite oracle deck, which is connected to the I Ching. And I pulled a card. The I Ching is a fascinating thing that I've talked about at some points on the show before, but just to give like the shortest summary that I can reasonably give is an ancient divination system using 64 configurations. And these 64, I guess, uh, philosophies or I, or types of, I guess, modalities that energy or consciousness can be in. They match to and map to the 64 codons our DNA has. Um, it connects to computing with 64-bit computing. It's an 8x8 eight eight grid that is also representing infinity because 8x8 eight eight is 64. 8 turned sideways is infinity. So if you've got infinite time and infinite space, you've got this 64 shape grid on a numerological level. So. Maybe that's not the greatest explanation of what the I Ching is, but when you pull a card, just like with any Oracle deck, because the wrong thing can't happen, if you're open to the meaning in the moment, then the energy of the card will match the moment and you'll get the picture. So I drew a card from this favorite Oracle deck of mine with uh, just the vibe that I was still holding on to after our conversation, me and Izzy's conversation. And I got number 57, which is the gentle or gentleness. And this is a cool one because it represents the energy of air or wind in both positions, in both the uh, above and below position. So it's just like pure wind or pure air. And that's a powerful thing. And contemplating that led me into a lot of places. But specifically, I wanted to crack open this book called Gene Keys by Richard Rudd, which is an awesome bridge work that combines both like the science of DNA and the I Ching and a couple other systems, I think astrology and lots of stuff all into one package that sort of lets you see what these 64 configurations of your consciousness and your energy are, what they look like when they're in the shadow imbalance, when they're in a light imbalance, and when they're perfectly balanced. So in that context, you have the shadow, which is the negative aspect of this particular energy system. And then you have the gift, which is the positive element, positively balanced element of this uh, number, I guess. And then you have the city, which is like the transcendental alchemical perfection version of what the energy is like in this configuration. So 57, gentleness. I wanted to give you guys a little bit uh, more information about what that book says about this card, because I mean, the whole reason I'm bringing it up is because I think it so amazingly pertains to specifically Izzy and her lifestyle, but also 
the mentality required or not mentality, but the, the knowing <laughs> is really a lot about intuition, the knowing required to make the uh, steps into your, your true power of, you know, the type of lifestyle that she does live, like living freely, like the wind blowing through place to place, ubiquitously <laughs> touching everybody a little bit. That definitely sounds like the uh, description of a traveling artist. So I will give you a rundown of the shadow part of this reading and then the gift and then the city or the superpower. And this will be paraphrasing a little bit from what this book talks about, but then also kind of connecting it to everything else that we've been discussing, specifically the shadow. Let's start there. The shadow of gentleness and of the wind and of the pervasiveness of spirit is unease. So we have this fear band frequency that we move through, especially in the stage of development that we're in. And it's related to the morphogenetic field of the entire human species, the giant uh, group together, aura, all of our auras linked together are carrying all of the frequencies that exist. So because we're looped into everybody else, no matter what, we're going to pass through certain low frequency band experiences or feelings or vibrations, you could say. And because of that, that this really this this shadow specifically is dealing with that. It's the general feeling of unease or the what the Buddhists would call the innate dissatisfaction of being. It's just that like creeping feeling that things aren't okay. And it's uh, really important that we realize and recognize where that comes from. And it has to do with the fact that our minds have taken over the job of our bodies or of our instincts in a lot of places. We've started out on, at least if you want to take a sort of evolutionary view towards things, we started out in a much more body-centric type of life. We probably didn't have language. We probably communicated much more empathetically, psychically, perhaps, just gestures and feelings. And we all knew we were on the same team as one another, so we didn't have to say a lot other than you know, make the appropriate reaction whenever there's a tiger behind you about to get you. And so how fear worked in this version of humanity was that it was a feeling you got in your body of not being comfortable that gave you the information you needed to take action to protect yourself, preserve yourself. But now that we've entered a more mentalized version of humanity, where we've started to actually take functions from the body and put them into the mind and into the language filter, now we have a lot of reasons why things aren't okay the way they are. A lot of them revolving around program thought patterns that we've gotten branded into us as children until we have the ability to take the time and recognize them, look at them and realize what they are instead of just letting them be that dull, humming, ominous background noise that they are without our awareness. And so because we are now in such a mentally strong version of ourselves, we deal with this unease by layering more and more levels of armor and security onto ourselves, which in and of itself is basically an illusion. There's no guarantee that everything is safe at any point or that anything is safe at any point, right? There's always the potential for chaos or for something out of your specific control to happen. Like that's part of actually the divine feminine is the surprise element of reality. Things happening that aren't expected or aren't known. But whenever we are allowing our minds to so fully dominate our instincts, that also means that our mind is dominating our intuition and we don't hear its voice anymore. So with all the shadows of all of these 64 energy configurations, there is a version that's like the hyperactive version and then the repressed version. And with, this, with unease, the repressive version of it is hesitancy. It's that lack of ability to decide, you know, you're not in the moment enough to know what you want. You're too worried about like, well, what if this or what if this? And you just kind of never make a move. And that's a good way to keep yourself from following your dreams or, you know, just going on a, any kind of adventure or a journey. There's a million reasons why you might hesitate if you stop and think about them too long. And that's going to be true no matter how good of an idea anything is. But when you're stuck in that loop of, overanalyzing the moment so far that you're taken out of the moment, that's where you get hesitancy. There's a lot of ways that this can manifest, but in general, that indecisiveness is coming out of a feeling of unease. And then the overactive version of that would be impetuousness, where you make impulsive decisions that aren't really good for you because you don't feel it out first. You're just like 
trying to hop from thing to thing quickly enough and maybe like stay ahead of the wave of anxiety or whatever of the the feeling uneasy where you are because you're always moving to the next thing. This is a lot more my style as a, as a person for dealing with the unease, like just frantically hopping from thing to thing is uh, something I've dealt with in the past, no doubt. And not really knowing what's good for me because I'm too quickly switching from one thing to the next. But once we bring awareness to the feeling inside ourselves, the the society basically level version of uh, reality that is giving you all this unease, which I would call the super ego actually, because it's this voice in your head that's not actually you, almost like an artificial intelligence that is programmed to sound like what other people will think of you. And it has other elements too, th- reasons why you should be afraid, but it generally revolves around your expectation of your image that other people have of you. And the biggest problem with this alternate self or this uh, artificial self that's got a constant dialogue going on in your head is that it drowns out the actual intuition, which comes to you as that still quiet voice. It's the gentle voice. That's why that's where all this connects back to the concept of gentleness is right here. The intuition can't be heard over all the racket, but that the spirit that lies within all things is actually the soft, dark core of it that is not really visible. It's just sensible. You can just feel it's there. You can know it's there, but it's never going to get in front of all your other senses and show itself to you that dramatically, at least not while you're in, you know, in lower vibrational realities. And when you get to higher vibrational realities, the mind starts behaving in completely different ways. And that's its own thing to get to. But for right now, as humanity is very much in the unease a frequency, we need to deal with that first, which is to dismantle the pattern by bringing awareness to it. And that just and also to silence the uh, inner critic and the super ego voice by bringing awareness to it. One highly interesting thing that this author goes into in the Gene Keys book is to say that the programming that makes this voice say what it says comes to you mostly when you're in the womb and that the f- three trimesters of your mother being pregnant with you correlate to the first seven year cycles in your life. The first set, one to seven, eight to 14, 15 to 21. And that in the, those trimesters, whatever is going on with your mother and her reaction to things is going to inform the way that you develop through the body, the mind and your spiritual development. And fascinating thing for me that I can point to and say that actually seems like it's kind of right is, I mean, it could be a coincidence, of course, everything could be, but the fact that it came to my mind so quickly after reading that section made me go, okay, that's probably intuition telling me there is a connection there. And it's not really like a major thing. It's just sort of anecdotal and interesting. But my mom in her third trimester of pregnancy with me, she actually broke her ankle. She fell and slipped on some ice and broke her ankle. And in that third uh, part of my first 21 years of development, probably halfway through, I think I was like 17 or 18. So that's like right between 15 and 21, which is, you know, uh, I guess exactly, pretty much exactly the ratio of when it happened in my mother's pregnancy during the third trimester, right in the middle of the third trimester. So right then at that point in my life, I had a major leg injury or a knee injury, actually. And it it's not the exact same thing. It was a knee, not an ankle. But although I did have problems with my ankles at that time period, too, that could also have connections to Pisceanness because that's a foot sign. But all this being said is you can actually see the connection between your your mother and father, and especially your mother, to your mentality now. And they give us a lot of gifts and strength, but we also got to be careful that the fears that they gave us don't paralyze us and that we only inherit what is empowering and bring healing in ourself to through awareness to the things that we inherited that are fear-based because it actually helps them heal past it too. And at the point, whenever you pass the age of 21, you start becoming as much a teacher. I mean, you're always a teacher to your parents, but you can really start becoming a conscious teacher to your parents because you've now sort of graduated from your first set of cycles. And I think it is a really liberating part of life for those of us that have the opportunity to form strong adult friendship relationships with our parents and through that, get their more uncensored story (laughs) that they didn't tell you when you were a kid about what they did, who they were, what they were like, you know, and see where those things correlate to yourself. And then you have that much more 
perceptual ability to go, okay, I might be in a pattern that is actually older than even myself. And because of that, I definitely don't need to identify it as like, this is my fuck up and I have to beat myself up over it. You can recognize that this is actually just the pattern that happens in this particular vibration. Uh, and there you go. <laughs> then it's you're transcending it already because the first thing that's keeping you attached to it is identifying with the shadow, whatever it is, the unease. The rest of what I'll share from this book has to do with how once we activate intuition really powerfully and start to move into the superpower version of it, it connects us to the collective human unconscious or the Akashic field or whatever name you might want to give it. And you start pulling information that you didn't consciously know in this lifetime at all. And where this all relates to Izzy, it has specifically to do with the fact that she has these Lemurian visions and you know can bridge to the spirit world and all kinds of stuff that I'm sure she doesn't even tell us about because it's too personal and she just doesn't want to, you know, it's actually important not to overly interpret your own experiences and try to solidify them sometimes. And so some things are best kept to ourselves and what we are going through internally, but not always. It's just about knowing where those boundaries lie and keeping yourself free to have a mutable experience of your own visions and your own inner belief structures as you view them from the inverted telescope of practices like meditation. And I guess that's all I have about that for now. I think that if you enjoyed this type of breakdown, looking at something from a shadow perspective and turning it into a, a power, <laughs> just the way that your unease and that feeling is actually a type of empathy that you can tap into if you just transmit it from the mental to the physical. You'll start picking up on the vibes of people all around you and of the environment you're in. And that's what starts giving you the sales to go with the wind, go with the flow, instead of having to constantly try to force yourself to do things and motiv motivate yourself to do things. <laughs> and I guess I should probably wrap this up. I'm pretty long in the wind on this outro, but I think that it was a brilliant conversation, especially the plus extension. I hope a lot of you do get to hear that. And the reason why I wanted to talk so much after it was over, because it left me with such a powerful impression about what it means to really live this type of free and nomadic lifestyle, but also be rooted wherever you're at and develop so quickly and rapidly as Izzy seems to do. I mean, only six years of painting. That's awesome. I know all of you out there are capable of being a completely new and transformed person within six or seven years. The cells in your body will be all new in seven years. So I think change is the only constant. We should embrace it and not let our need for security keep us from breaking down the walls and taking off the armor and seeing ourselves and each other for what we truly are which is divine infinite potential playing with itself eternally <laughs> so i guess that'll be it make sure you do check out izzy's website or instagram or facebook all of the things and give her a like give her a follow tell her you heard her on the show tell her you liked it because i liked having her and i love you guys i'll see you out there on the internet somewhere for another interverse.